So, I have two names. Um, professionally, I've always been Matthew Mark. So very fancy. Around town, it's always been Matt Marcus. So this has been a weird transition where I'm not being Matt Marcus after talking to Kevin. But instead, I'm here to introduce myself as Matthew Marquis of Marquis Home Renovation. I am a carpenter. That is why, throughout the entirety of my slide deck, you're going to feel like you're looking at the side of a badass station wagon. I'd still drive it. As for where I work, it's here. This is my actual workbench. It's older than I am. These are my actual planes. They're older than me also. Um, that pile of oak and mahogany is the start of a new coffee table. As for like websites or whatever, like Adam said, I work at Oak. Editor of the W3C HTML5 specification, blah, 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 make websites. Um, but I'm not here to talk about it, because you are in no capacity here to see me. You're here with purpose. You're all here to learn. And I'm here to teach you about furniture. <laughs> this is a Queen Anne tea table, uh, thought to be made in either New England or Ireland, circa 1750. Came right at the advent of the federal style and was gaining popularity on the tale of Thomas Chippendale's much more ornate work. Um, though you could argue that his use of mahogany is what led to the federal style. Right? Road workers began to favor interesting grain patterns over ornate carvings. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second because that was a lot, so you guys probably got a bunch of notes. Good. Nobody typing? That's weird. Um, you don't care. It's a table. It keeps your coffee off the floor. What a table is, for almost everybody here, I would bet, is its purpose. Likewise, you're here to learn about websites. Who cares about me? And definitely, who cares about tables? Point is, up here, I'm kind of reduced to my purpose. I'm just a vehicle for transferring information. So let's talk about websites. Not the way I would talk about furniture, if you gave me a chance. This is about the user that just wants to keep their coffee off the floor. They don't care about the website, they don't care about frameworks, they don't care about their own browser. They want their information and they want to get out. The website to them is just its purpose. When we present users with a slow website, a loading spinner, laggy web fonts, we tell them outright that they're not using the website the right way. We're breaking the fourth wall. We're forcing the user to think about the website and not the reason they're there. We're lecturing them about chairs when all they want to do is sit there. In April of 2014, there were 267 million active users of Opera, mobile Opera houses, and that's still trending steadily up. To scale, there are around 220 million iPads sold during the entirety of 2014. This page treats those 267 million users like a rounding error, urging them to join the mainstream. By choosing to use this browser, they have made a mistake. They've done something wrong. During that same April, Opera Mini users generated only 4.4 billion megabytes of data. Grand scheme across the whole internet, that sounds like very little. Data in Opera Mini is heavily compressed to 90%. Though if this data were uncompressed, Opera Mini users would have generated only 17 petabytes of data, just in April. How would a user ever move to a browser that makes them slog through to 90% or more junk just to get to the thing that they came to that website to see in the first place? Because it's easier for us. When we prize convenience over craft, we're building a web for us, developers. We're building a web that's easy to assemble, but lousy to use. <laughs> well, any developers from IKEA are here. I didn't see any out of it, so I Yeah, building a web that's easy to assemble, lousy to use. We can do that. This job, this whole career is brand new. More or less the first generation of web developers and designers. You and I get to define what being a web developer means. All the generations, all the developers that have It's not what the web is to me. It's not what this job is. The meaning I take from this gig doesn't come from getting a div to show up in the right corner of the screen. It comes from knowing that working just a little bit harder can mean that entire populations just setting foot on the web for the first time, be able to tap into the collected knowledge of the web man. It's huge. There is no other job in the world. We can 
make this a job where we make something work as much as it has to, a handful of easy browsers that somebody put on a list are or we can make this job a lot of work and harder. We can make up our minds that we want everything we do on the web, nudge it towards something better, faster, more inclusive. We can build for the web's real purpose, connecting people all around the world. And when we put in that work, we get better at it. It gets easier. It becomes the way we do things by default. That's where we make the job. So we're not going to talk about you and me. We're not going to talk about that. Let's talk about how real people around the world use the web. I really like after all that like lofty talk about hard work and craft, I lead off with the worst chart anyone has ever seen. This took like six hours. Shows <laughs> those colors very carefully. If you know the fault. Um, anyway, mobile and tablets account for a 35. 0.3% of all internet traffic worldwide, trending steadily up, and not the first person. In many parts of the world, desktop traffic is practically non existent. Building massive resource heavy websites means excluding millions of users who will only ever know the web by the way of a feature phone or something like that. Users who are paying for every kilobyte they consume. I don't mean some nebulous hand lady bandwidth cost, I mean actual economic costs. They have to keep tabs on which sites they need to avoid day to day. Is it in the moment? Yeah, I got sharks. Don't worry about sharks. When you take us out of the equation, the world overwhelmingly views the web via an edge connection. And even here at home, the prevalent mobile connection is 3G at best. In just the third quarter of 2014, there were 110 million new mobile subscriptions. 102 million of these were in areas where the prevalent network is annual. Well, let's be honest. These figures are pretty easy to win. You maybe have cited some of these in media class that have been waved away, but well, those aren't our target markets. If you're at home, this isn't really a problem. Well, as it stands right now, some 20% of US users use their smartphones almost exclusively for internet access. Either have no broadband service or limited access to it. 7% of those users have absolutely no access to the internet. Meanwhile, almost a third of those smartphone-dependent users frequently run up against their mobile data. They do this almost every month. Huge slow websites mean not only letting our target audience down, but making it impossible to ever expand our reach beyond that audience. Let's talk about how we're going to change that. The way I see it, responsive design is still pretty new in the grand scheme of things. We're all still kind of just getting there. We're a little clumsy about a few things right now. We have some tools that we need to get started in the right direction. The average web page's total transfer size is for goddamn things. <laughs> As of a few months ago, we broke the two megabyte mark. It's a qualified Images alone account for more than 60%. Now, over the past few years, the average weight of our CSS has barely much. Having a couple of media queries is not to blame for this one state. Our JavaScript has crept up a little bit, but given some of the incredibly rich interactions we've seen on the web in recent years, kilobytes there seems to be reasonable. Images, on the other hand, are doing tremendous damage. And things were looking pretty good for a while. I've cited these figures before. I've used this exact same slide in previous slides. The reason I'm showing this again here today is that something has changed. The average image weight is still increasing, but it's just started to slow down. It's a good thing, too. No matter how nice your images are, you get a huge bandwidth of literating wall of pictures between your user and the game. Anything they came to your website to do will absolutely drive them. 160 kilobytes is practically nothing for any of us. It was enough to increase that Etsy's bounce rate. I don't know this for a fact, but wishful thinking, I sincerely hope that the slowing trend towards massive image weights on the web comes from some of the new, smarter image delivery options we have from a responsible images. A few years ago, we had zero native options for serving assets in a more responsible way. 
now we have an incredible number of options. Um, and that's a huge thing. Cutting down on the size of our images is the single biggest size optimization we can make. Going through and improving our CSS and JavaScript. A lot of you, uh, native responsive images will not be huge news. I some of you may have at some point in the past heard whispers of a solution that was going along or heard about a fight between the one working groups, the source set, and the picture element put forth by a scrappy band of web standards rebels, their handsome, charismatic leader. <laughs> All that dust is set. We got a lot more out of it than just one new element that you decide. We got an entire suite of enhancements to the existing image element. And we got it brand new up for certain purposes. We have native options for dealing with retina screens, the size of an image and the layout, not just the size of the image. Even dealing with alternate image formats, something we've never had until maybe a year ago. It doesn't do us a lot of good discussing responsive images in fact. No sense of how they will actually lay out in the real world. So let's look at how we're implementing some of these. HPR HBR is already seeing a significant amount of mobile and tablet traffic. Um, the gap between mobile and desktop browsers started closing up pretty quickly following their response to the Unfortunately, that initial redesign didn't do anything to tailor their assets to varying contexts. Regardless of your viewport size or resolution, the article page always came with all the same assets. Full 2 megabytes of this page. In images. Just setting a max width in your CSS is probably it means you have to use image sources that are at least as large as the largest size of your surroundings. It's meant to be displayed anywhere between 2,000 and 2,000. This is exactly um, If it's going to be displayed anywhere from 2,000 pixels wide to 300 pixels wide, that same 2,000 pixel wide. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what that is either. I'm just gonna yell super loud. What's this? Okay. Oh, seriously? Oh, that's terrible. We'll be booming for the remainder of this talk, man. Welcome. <laughs> nice man. So, uh, a user on a small, low resolution display is gonna get saddled with all the same bandwidth costs high-resolution image, but ends up with none of the benefits. A high-resolution image on a low-resolution display looks like a low-resolution image. It just takes way longer to show up. And I don't mean for any of this to sound like a knock on HBR, especially because they were paying for my presence. And it's a sour business relationship, so we have to do a lot of time. Um, this is my nightmare. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm going to chew on the mic for the remainder of the talk. We do what we must. <sighs> HBR did a great job on this redesign, um, and they are not alone in these issues. 72% of responsive sites are sending roughly the same data to all users of all contexts. Only about 6% of responsive sites right now are taking significant steps to tailor those assets to users' contexts. I feel like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Any work we do with responsive images is more or less going to break down to some combination of these four use cases. Uh, the device pixel ratio use case deals only with the pixel density of a user's display, pretty much what it says on the tip. High definition versus low resolution for the definition screens, or retina, if, if you're into the whole brand name thing. These aren't images that are apt to change in size across the break points, uh, or at least they won't change very much. We just want high-resolution versions for high-resolution screens. That's it. That's all the logic we want to bake in here. The syntax is pretty cut and dry. Uh, we use the image element that we've come to know and love already, complete with an old-fashioned SRC attribute for the fallback, pointing to the standard definition version of the image most times. The new source set attribute then contains the path to the high-resolution image, the larger source, and a 2x flag signaling to the browser that this source should be used on displays with twice the pixel density. There's one tiny difference in behavior with this new marker, a 
but it's not huge. Normally, loading a retina appropriate image uh, means you're just loading an image source that's twice the size. Without any CSS to affect it, it comes in at twice the size of the smaller image. Since source set can tell the browser it's dealing with a, a double density image on a double density display, instead of any old image, the browser is able to render the image at the width and height it was meant to be originally, just at twice the density, but the same size as the 1x image. From a syntax standpoint, saying 2x on a high resolution display is pretty easy. Uh, but knowing when the user wants high resolution images is infinitely more difficult. If I'm on a retina MacBook but I'm tethered to a shaky 3G connection, which I very frequently am, I probably don't want massive high resolution images. The original responsive image proposals did a lot to handle resolution and image size, but they didn't do anything to address bandwidth concerns directly, and not for lack of discussion. We spent a lot of time talking through how we could tailor assets to a user's bandwidth specifically, and what kind of syntax might make the most sense for that. A server-side solution could give us an assumption based on a device type, but a mobile device is apt to be on anything from Wi-Fi to an edge connection, so that doesn't get us very far. The best thing we were able to come up with was a bandwidth media query. And every time I say this out loud, I look around the audience, and a couple of eyes light up. Because this sounds great. We then shared the email equivalent of silent, meaningful looks around a dinner table, as we all realized in unison how much we hated our own idea. <laughs> Web standards. It sounds great. If we had a bandwidth media query, we could tailor all of our assets. Viewport size, resolution, and network speed, which would be huge. There are a couple of serious problems there. First issue is that we couldn't ensure a consistent browsing experience with where I set that bandwidth breakpoint is completely different from where someone else might set. The user would end up with high resolution images on one website and low resolution images on the next. The web would look kind of broken. It would look like someone was just not doing the work. Plus, we'd be making all of this optional. What happens when somebody who signs the paychecks says, ah, uh, our images are very good. They're worth the win. Users will appreciate our super high-res images and photographers are expensive. We'd be making all of this optional. It shouldn't be up to us at all. It should be 100% up to the user. We shouldn't be allowed to intervene on their behalf because we can't say what they want. There is a technical problem here, too. Bandwidth is unpredictable, and media queries by design respond to changes in client context. Viewport height, width, device orientation, Soon even features like ambient light level. When a user first lands on a page, they might qualify for our high resolution images and then have their bandwidth drop off when they go through a tunnel. Now, because of the nature of media queries, we have to replace those high resolution images with low resolution images. Because it has to listen for client side changes. That's just how they work. That's how they're clean. As their connection speeds back up, we can now pull the high res images out of the cache again. So as your bandwidth moves up and down, and it does constantly. Things are just going to keep moving around on the screen. They look very, very broken. The only way to work around this would be to redefine the very nature of media queries themselves. And I don't know if anyone here is on any web standards mailing lists, but that idea does not generally fly. Source set is brand new, so we can do whatever the hell we want with that. So unlike media queries, source set is spec as a set of suggestions to the browser. Telling the browser, here are the sources that are most appropriate for this display. You're free to take them or leave them. By acting as a suggestion, source set will allow browsers to introduce user settings, like always give me low-res images, or give me high-res images as bandwidth permits. Instead of each of us drawing a different line for high and low resolution assets, it's now built into the entire browsing section. Instead of frantically responding to changes in bandwidth, the browser can just take an average across the whole browsing session and decide from what point on get high-res or low-res images. By adding that as a preference, we have now made it so the user can make this decision 100% independent of us. We get a short syntax that does what we need to do with day-to-day -day work with us. Serves high-resolution assets when appropriate. The user can now 100% make the decision as to whether they're taken or not. 
All of this is rolled within that one tiny attribute in that 2x syntax. It's very easy to use. The types use case is a little bonus that we almost literally managed to sneak into the spec. This syntax is not concerned with viewport size or resolution or anything about the client screen. It is concerned only with the image formats that are supported by the user's browser. It allows us to use the single request fallback pattern that's baked into some of these responsive images solutions serve only the correct image format in a responsible way. Newer image formats like WebP and even SVG, as long as it's been around, they come with tremendous benefits and huge, huge potential for, for bandwidth savings there. They also come with a major catch. New image format cannot have a built-in fallback pattern in it. If it's not recognized, it is not recognized in entirety. Working on HBR, we identified a few places where SVG assets make a lot more sense than the things they're currently using. It would give HBR a lot more flexibility in terms of styling these images, for sure. But more importantly, it would mean smaller image files. The best solutions we had for this a year or two ago all involved making a request for the new format before letting the browser decide whether or not it should throw it away and make a new request. This means an optimization in browsers that do have native support but an additional cost in browsers that don't. This is one of the more common patterns you'd see kicking around. It requests a WebP, and if the browser errors are trying to parse it, it replaces the SRC with the fallback source in that data edge. Everywhere but Chrome, even now, this would mean two requests. The picture element was introduced for the sake of applying custom logic to our requests before they even go out. And the fallback pattern is already baked in. In the event that this new markup is recognized at all, the image still is. That fallback source is requested if picture is completely unsupported. If it is supported, the browser looks through the list of sources for the mime type. If it recognizes that it supports that mime type, it'll fetch that image. If not, it throws that source away and fetches the fallback image as usual. Since using this attribute means we're providing the browser with that information right up front, it no longer has to make a request and throw it away knows right off the bat which source it needs. The sizes attribute is a big deal. It is a big, messy deal. This is the culmination of about three years of responsive images discussion, by which I absolutely need arguments on many lists. This is forged in the fires of passive aggressiveness. <laughs> the number one use case we needed solved was this. We want a way to provide the browser with a set of image sources. And then we want to walk away. We want the browser to choose the source that's best for, for the resolution, for the pixel density, for the size of the image in the layout, not just based on the viewport size, but the size of which that image will actually be displayed. We want it to factor in bandwidth. We want it to cover every possible concern we could have in fetching an image. This is a very tall order from a specification standpoint. From a developer standpoint, it couldn't be simple. What we want is our CMS to generate a list of sources from one image we upload, and then we don't want to think about responsive images any further than that. We don't want to show a bunch of options to the user. We don't want to have to hand code a bunch of things for its, its context in the page. We just want the CMS to generate more images. We'll use this markup in any situation where we don't need explicit control over sources. So all of the sources are identical, except for their sizes. Lead image on HBR article pages is a great example of this. We're not doing anything to change the cropping and the zooming of this image on smaller viewports. It just gets smaller, actually 100%. This sizes syntax, in concert with source set, allows us to provide the browser with a couple of sources and their information, and then let it take the wheel. Viewport size, pixel density, all of that is factored in when it chooses the most appropriate source for this list. This also means there's a room for the browser to get creative. Because source set is spec as a set of suggestions, it can use any heuristics it wants to pick those, those sources. Right now in Chrome and Firefox, I think only those two, source set will never load an image smaller than the version you already have in your cache. Because you're just scaling it down from there. Why make a request for smaller images when if you already have the larger one cached, that serves for the smaller ones too. If you start small and scale up, it pulls in new sources because those would be more appropriate for the layout. 
by giving up that explicit control completely, there's a ton of room for optimization. This is very tricky to understand at a glance, though. Unlike the 1x, 2x syntax we were using before with source set, we're not using this to tell the browser what to do at all. Instead, we're just giving the browser a list of sources and their inherent sizes, in this case, widths. Right now, these syntaxes only work with widths, so we're mostly concerned in terms of the images. The sizes attribute then tells the browser how these images are meant to be used in the layout. Not per the viewport, but per their actual size in the layout. 100 BW here means predictably enough. It will use 100% of the viewport. When the browser encounters this markup, it does a little familiar responsive web design math. Just like when we're putting our layouts together, it's target divided by context. Let's say we're looking at this markup on an iPhone with a 320 pixel wide display. 100% of that is predictably enough 300 pixels. Our smallest image has an inherent width of 400 pixels, so we divide that against the screen size of 320 that we put inside. Next up is 800, we do the same division, and so on down the whole list. You could have 15 sources in here. It just keeps on doing this now. These calculated values, then deep within the browser or internals or the cloud or wherever websites have it. It treats them the same as the 1x, 2x syntax that we would write out by hand, but tailored to the user's viewpoint size. We run a Retina iPhone with a 320 pixel wide display. The browser here would choose the 2.5x source, medium source, because that's the closest to 2x. That's the most appropriate for that display, unless the user preference is available, whatever it means. If we run a non Retina iPhone with the smallest source would be loaded, that makes the most sense on a low resolution display size. If we were to view that syntax from before on a 640 pixel wide display, though, the results of all that math will change completely. Now the smallest version will never match. It's too small for a 640 pixel wide display at any pixel density. The medium source now matches on low resolution devices, and the highest source matches on high resolution devices. Because we're using source set, again, these are all just suggestions to the browser. It's free to take these or leave these. These are just the most appropriate for that viewpoint. Size is attribute with 100 BW it didn't make any sense on HBO. These images are never 100% of the viewport. In fact, and I've lost the timing on this slide every single time I've given this. But there is one change, yeah, I wrote it again. There is one point where the size of the image changes in the layout, where it goes from smallest breakpoints at around 97% of the viewport to the medium enough breakpoints where it's around 50-ish. Luckily, sizes, and this is a little scary looking too, allows us to specify all the information about breakpoints we could ever need for those images. Uh, using good old fashioned media queries, at least that syntax is immediately recognizable. This is some unruly looking markup, but the effect this has is amazing. At the top is a real image from hbr.org using the source set and sizes markup and wired up to a handful of image sources. Below is the exact same markup with each image source size flat, explicitly. Plunge some CSS together to make it sort of look the way it would look in the viewport, but I did this in like 10 minutes, so forgive me. Um, if you land on this page on a device with a small viewport, this smallest source is all that ever gets loaded. That's it. It's a way smaller, way more tailored experience. Even if you resize the page from there now, there's no visual lag. In fact, you can't see the image at the top changing at all because all this is happening at the browser level. The new source only appears when it's ready to be displayed, so you don't see any of these requests going on. Users always get the source that's most appropriate to their viewpoint size, and as we resize back down, we already have the largest version in our cache, so we just use that all the way through. There's no need to make additional requests if that one works for everybody. The size of syntax is a lot to make fun of. I feel like I'm being shot at with the mic. The size of syntax is a lot to make sense of all at once. Um, I had to try it out for myself a handful of times once it actually existed in browsers before I really got the hang of it, and I helped write this spec. It's very confusing at a glance. Once it clicks, though, you realize you never have to care about any of that math at all. Um, it allows
allows you to just generate some image sources, give the browser some information, and walk away. It doesn't matter how it makes those decisions on what source is most appropriate. It just always chooses the most appropriate one. In fact, you may not have to handwrite any of this markup at all. Is anyone here familiar with the popular CMS platform WordPress? <laughs> I won't have a tattoo of the popular CMS. I'm a little surprised. <laughs> Since automation for this stuff is 100% the point, we don't want to have to fish through a bunch of markup every time we upload a new image. Um, every step of this process could be left to the CMS. You write it all once, the CMS does it forever more when an image is uploaded. We are working on getting into the, this into the WordPress core, 4.4 maybe. Um, Drupal 8 is shipping with this by default, I think, right now. It is, it is on its way in a lot of capacities. Um, everyone here should absolutely be helping us test this plugin. Join our Slack channel. I will PayPal you a dollar to break this plugin. No pressure or anything. But I wrote the spec and helped with the plugin, and if it breaks a quarter of websites, probably that's on me. Please help us test. Dollar fifty. Dollar fifty? Jeremy? Two dollars. <laughs> Since the very first incarnation of the picture element, lo those many three or four ish years ago, we've been looking to solve the art direction use case. It isn't anywhere near as common as any of the other use cases we've gone through today. It is very rare and very specialized. In fact, we're not using it on HBR at all. Art direction comes into play whenever you want to specify an alternate version of the image completely, sort of, for different sizes. Different cropping and zooming to better highlight the feature of an image. Um, as a syntax, media queries makes the most sense here. A lot of times we we'll want these to line up with the media queries in our layout. Styles. This use case refers to any situation where you need 100% explicit control over what sources show where. Unlike source set, where you give it a list and walk away and it applies them whenever. These are absolutes. When we specify a media query in our picture element, it happens, full stop. Here on the World Wildlife Foundation homepage, the image varies a little. CSS. You can crop off the edges and do an overflow hidden thing. But that's not tenable. So we can't say for sure what images will be uploaded. We may not always want to zoom in on a bit of it. We may not have a predictable set of places where we will zoom in. And we're still saddling the users with the additional download of things they don't need. In this case, stuff they can't see at all, let alone the resolution. Now, our direction does not apply to radically different image sources. A good rule of thumb is that you should be able to describe all of the sources in a picture element using the one alt attribute on the image that's inside. All the accessibility hinges on the existing accessibility of that image. That alt has to describe everything in the picture. I very deliberately say rule of thumb when I say that. Because I put my name on all this and I like super pinky swore that nobody would ever use this to serve up like, welcome to my iPhone site. Rule of thumb means if, if you do this, I'll find you, I'll break it. I'll break it. It's true. I have such mixed reception to saying that, depending on the talk. Like at super fancy places where it's $2,000 a ticket, everyone's like, I didn't come here to get my thumbs broken. Very, very familiar to anybody who followed the entire responsive images saga from start to finish. Um, it's more or less the same markup Bruce Lawson originally proposed way back when we first started talking about all of this. Multiple source elements inside of the picture element wrapper. This is just like the video and audio elements. We repurpose that exact same markup pattern with a media attribute telling the browser when these sources should be applied. The first source with a media attribute that matches is the one that's loaded, and all following that are thrown away. If we're using min with media queries, we want to have the largest sources come first. If none of the source elements match at all, the fallback image is loaded as the default source. No user ends up left without an image with this pattern. 
And if you need super precise, pixel perfect control for both when a source element is applied and individual resolutions within that source element, these source elements use the source set attribute by default. So that same 1x, 2x syntax applies here. The same bandwidth, preference, all of those things apply here. The media attribute is always absolute. Is going to choose that source of device. What all these different syntaxes have in common is that they all give us options for delivering only the image sources. I was shot at before and I was lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Playing Destiny on the stage. Uh, we're using a 320 pixel wide display on the HBR homepage. And this isn't up yet, so don't, don't look at it and call me out on it, but looking at my local. It reduced the image weight of the home page by an estimated 88%. 320 pixels wide, low resolution. There is still a ton of work to do. This is using WordPress, um, but only for the sake of outputting an atom feed that is consumed by a job monstrosity. There is yet some work to do. And as far as the markup goes, it took one of us maybe 10 minutes to write that, and then hand that off to the back end team and say, make this happen. Output these sources whenever they are. This is very complicated, all of this at first, but once it clicks, a little bit of work here is a huge way for our users. And as new as these standards are, the list of supported browsers is growing very quickly. All these responsive images techniques have been available in Chrome since version 38, Firefox 38, with a few caveats, um, and Opera since 27. And last but not least, and I can scarcely believe. The very first version of Microsoft Edge will ship with about half of these by default, which is pretty damn good. At the times they are a change. If you notice that this was conspicuously absent from that list, you are correct. We are still building it in the RICG. Um, a couple of weeks ago, source set and sizes were shipped in the WebKit 90s. Grab a copy of this and help us test it out. Because again, talking about the core of all websites, no pressure. Not Browsers that don't yet support any of these syntaxes, there's a polyfill that has everybody covered. Scott Jill's picture fill um, mimicked the behavior of the proposed picture on it way back at the start using div spans and data attributes, just so we could kind of get our heads around how this pattern might play out while we were writing this pattern. Since then, that script has evolved into a full-blown responsive images polyfill. Source set, picture, even types with a handful of different types, all of that is shown by picture fill. And for that reason, it has to become the official responsive images polyfill of the RICG. Very into our logo. I don't know if that comes to mind. But bitmap images are really only half the responsive images story. Um, retina screens mean retina assets across the board. Retina icons mean a handful of requests for images that can be up to four times larger on every page. And that adds up really quickly. Now, I've always been a bitmap. I mean, pixels made a lot of sense to me. The little squares. Legend of Zelda is made out of pixels. I really like that game. Um, I knew that there were tremendous benefits to SVG, especially where resolution and file size were concerned. And I knew that support was pretty decent, but I was still hesitant to work with it. Because it was vectors, and so far as I know, vectors are made of math. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Now, if you're anything like me, every day is a constant struggle to use a computer in even the simplest of ways. Just me. It's only me. Um, as such, you might have accidentally opened up an image file in your code editor in the past. Literally no one. Predictably enough, when you do this, it is total gibberish. I did that with an SVG one day, because again, struggling to use computers. And I queued up a whole new world from Latin, which is my jam. I shed a single tear because it was with markup. It was weird, janky front page markup, so far as I could tell. But it's markup. Like, I understood this at a glance, kind of. The simple edits, like changing the color or opacity of an icon, we don't have to fire up Adobe Illustrator and jank around with vectors. We just make those changes in the SVG. It's code, like we're all used to using. We can style them and animate them with real CSS. We can add scripts to SVGs, just like any other page on the web. It's an image format that's very much built for the way the web is built. Where they fall short, however, was universal support. 
I work in a ton of browsers, but not all of them. Most notably on older versions of Android, including my favorite vintage, 2.3, which is still very, very widely used. In fact, brand new and expensive devices are shipping with Android 2.3. Serving these up to everybody indiscriminately is not an option, because not having icons at all potentially depending on the site can be a site you can't use. So a few years ago, Filament Group started hashing out an idea for a new tool we could use to automate the fallback part of the process. Even if we could edit and build an SVG from scratch in our code editor, outputting and fall, uh, exporting a fallback ping meant firing up Adobe Photoshop or whatever and mucking around an image editor. So it wasn't practical. The workflow was terrible. So we started coming up with a tool that would automate all those fallbacks, which wasn't really all that hard in and of itself. But at the same time, there was another factor. Something we aimed to destroy for a while. Something we hated. Sprite sheets. I hate them as I hate hell. All Montague, etc., etc. I hate making them. I hate working with them. Raise your hand if you ever, today, in 2015, the future, Lexus just invented a hoverboard, still find yourself working with sprite sheets ever. Yeah. It's horrible. They're a relic. They are a hack. But you can't argue against their effectiveness. It is a single cache request, one time, for all the icons on your entire site. But again, there are hoverboards now. We can do better. Instead of a single image file, we thought about putting all of our icons in a single style sheet using data URIs. A method of passing the browser the all the image data itself instead of a link to the image external. This style sheet would basically act as our sprite sheet. This would be one request for all of the icons on our site, and it's cached the same way. Except if we wanted to add a new icon later, we wouldn't have to muck around with image editors and background positions and always inevitably screwing up by one pixel and throwing off every other icon on the site. You've all done it. I know you have. The best part of this is that data URIs contain a ton of repetition. If this is served up with GZIP, it compresses down to way smaller than a sprite sheet with identical icons. This still sucks to work with. This means you have to go and convert all these images to data URIs by hand and paste them into a style sheet. And then we need to do it all over again with a set of fallback bags. This is clearly a job for automation. I'm willing to put 99% of the use grunts, or half the use grunts, or the use grunts. Shout out to Boku. From the command line, you set it to watch the directory, concatenate all your files, if anything changes, minify your JavaScript, CSS, etc. Automate your responsive images, for example. If you want to have it output a bunch of different props, just as an aside, you can do that. So we developed a grunt task that automated that whole SVG work. We pointed out a directory full of SVGs, and Gruntacon, Gruntacon generates a directory of ping fallbacks for you, invisible. It then outputs three style sheets. The first is a data URI style sheet of all of our SVGs. The second is a style sheet containing all of our data URI fallback pings. For browsers without support for data URIs at all, which largely amounts to very old IE, it generates a second level of fallback, a style sheet that just links out to all the pings it generated the old fashioned way. This works. It's not glamorous, it's not quick, but you still get icons even if you're in IE6. And that's not something you necessarily need for that site to be usable in IE6, so you can opt out of that completely. Runticon comes with a small script that chooses the most appropriate style sheet to load for that user. Um, we have tested this fallback pattern to an obsessive extent. So far, a few years on, we have yet to identify any situation where any combination of device and browser gets the wrong icons or no icons at all. The red column there is icon fonts, just saying. Just throwing that out there. I got no love for icon fonts. This works pretty good. By default, it uses the file names to generate the icons classes. So you don't have to think about this fallback pattern at all when you're using it. You just slap the class on whatever element and you style it as usual. It's just a background. There's no worry about some other background icon bleeding through. You just use it like you would an external image. It's 
very, very convenient. Automation is great. Design profoundly lazy. Uh, infinitely scalable icons with tiny file sizes, very good. Single cache request for every icon on our site, and never again worrying about background positions or slapping in an empty div for the sake of an icon. I am a huge fan of Rontacon. I was very happy with this as it stood. Good folks at Filament Group are lunatics. All of this still wasn't good enough because we were losing a lot of the power of SVG in the process. We couldn't add scripts or styles to SVGs using Rontacon. Um, we couldn't use CSS to add things like hover events, which is somewhere that icon fonts actually work out a lot better. At least not without swapping these icons on wholesale for a different image on hover, which is really cool. Until just a few short months ago, when Filament Group released Rontacon 2. It, it's very weird to stand up in front of like a couple hundred people and say the word Gruntacon. It's the main idea. And Gruntacon does not help. It's going to get worse. In order to script and style SVGs, you can't use them as background images. Using an SVG as a background image is an image effectively flat. They have to be embedded in the page itself, the style of the Runticon 2 uses this same data URI fallback pattern we talked about a second ago by default. It allows you to use an optional data attribute on an element to say that this SVG should be embedded inside this element in the page, not used as a background. So let's say we're going to use this land icon in a couple of places on a page. We want it in three different colors. We use the class Runticon as a sign based on that original SVG. Icon layer. Since we want to style it with CSS, we'll use that data in Runticon embed data attribute on the element. Now we can inspect that element as usual to dig into the SVG. A lot of us is terrifying vector math nonsense. It's fine. A couple parts of it are immediately recognizable. Element, a class, and a fill attribute, and we can kind of guess at what fill means. Since that's all part of the page now, the same as any other element. We can use CSS the way we'd use it on a div. I'll be able to some SVG specific CSS, a fill property to match that attribute. If you ever get to thinking, like, you know, I'm alright at CSS. I like shrug off the vertical centering jokes, because I know how to do that. I'm very good at CSS. I would highly recommend to look through the SVG specification. It is a deeply humbling. Experience. SVGs can do a terrifying number of things that regular marketing CSS can. It's incredible. Between JavaScript and CSS, we can do some unreal things to enhance our icons. And Gruntacon gives us a really convenient workflow, so we don't have to think about fallback now every time we want to use something really like this. But most important of all, we're still, for all this, working with smaller files for these icons that a set of pings would have been. And they can scale to whatever size and resolution you might need with the fallback pattern baked in. And if you're not using Grunt as part of your workflow now, or if you're on the Gulp or the Rockme or the Lunch or the Bloom, I don't know what they, there's like 500 task orders. If you're not using any of those, we've put together a web version of this just for you. Can't do any of the brand new embedded stuff. Not yet, anyway. This will allow to put all of your style sheets, all of your fallbacks, everything. And I'll be honest, if you don't think this is the best designed website you're going to see in this entire conference, I'm not sure you're going to have a lot to say to each other for the rest of the day. His name's Grumpy. Grumpy the Grunt of Corn. We have fun. We have fun. We've lost our time. Now that our websites are smaller, we can start to focus on making them faster. And we've gone a long way here. A smaller websites are faster website, no matter how you look at it. But there's a plot twist here when we talk about performance in fact. We're not necessarily talking about raw horsepower like so many things diesel. We're talking more about perceived performance. The time it takes for the site to look and feel usable to the user, not the actual time for all the requests to go through. Most useful value in a page is that 
user's perspective, to actually see another throttle connection in a different browser or more locally. I am a big fan of web page test title work for this. Uh, it is not going to win any design awards, I assume. It allows you to do an incredible amount of user-focused performance testing. One of my favorite features is the timeline. It allows you to do a quick visual comparison between websites, sure, to see which is quicker. That's cool, and it's going to compete with people. Um, but more importantly, you can use this to gauge the impact of changes you've made on the site. When you make a performance-related change, or just once every X days, you can test your current site against an older version of your own site and see what the difference is. So even though they're some of the smallest requests on the front, Requests for external style sheets can have the biggest impact on the time it takes for a page to finish loading. When we talk about performance, you'll hear a lot about blocking requests, meaning that the page won't even start to render until all those assets have been requested and fully transferred and parsed. There's a good reason for that. If our style sheets didn't block, we'd still be getting flashes of unstyled content like back in the day. But for assets that might not be necessary right away for the page to look and feel finished, we could drastically improve performance by deferring some requests, by avoiding that blocking behavior. In a perfect world, we'd be able to use that media attribute that we've come to know and love from responsive images to serve only the style sheets that apply to the user's context. This doesn't work, and there's very good reason for that too. Like we talked about earlier, media queries are designed to respond to changes in the client context. Uh, window size, resolution, and so on. If we didn't start to load a style sheet until it applied, we could end up with a flash of unstyled content as the user resized the page. Worse, if their connection dropped out during a browsing session and they resized the window, they could be left with no styles at all. Even if a style sheet doesn't apply, and it could never potentially apply, it has to block the rendering of the page until that asset has been fully we end up making users wait for assets they potentially won't need. The good news is that some modern browsers, and that's very, very few, will raise or lower the priority of a style sheet based on that attribute. Deprioritized requests won't block the page, from, they won't prevent the page from appearing. The style sheets that are necessary to render the page right away, based on that media attribute, will still block render, but the others will be loaded after. We can avoid all of this, technically, by inlining all of our CSS in the head of every page. Just bust out Adobe Page Maker, party like it's 1999. Everything in the page all the time. No external assets. It just sucks to maintain, obviously, and we lose caching, and it is generally a maintenance nightmare, and it's awful, and we're never going to do this. We would have to be crazy to do this, so we're going to do this. But we're going to do so in a very calculated way. A new TCP IP connection can include up to 10 TCP packets, which is about 14 kilobytes, give or take, in the very first response from a server. That's more than enough to get a markup into the browser during that initial connection, that first handshake. But it doesn't include any external requests, no style sheets, no JavaScript, just the markup and any styles on the inline of the head of the page. So what if we snuck in only the styles we needed to make the page look finished? And it doesn't have to be the entire page, maybe just the styles we need to make the first 2,000 pixels of the page look finished, or the user's going to land. We could inline those above the fold, I know, styles, and include them in the initial 14 kilobyte transfer. We end up delivering a visually complete page in the time it takes to make that initial TCP. Since we can't rely on media attributes to deprioritize a style sheet that we want to serve asynchronously after the fact, after we've loaded all those critical styles, we'll just use a little JavaScript to load our non critical CSS needs. A little function named load CSS. It just injects a style sheet in the head of the page in a regular two minutes. The head of our admittedly now weird looking pages would play out something like this. We have a block of our critical CSS inline, not shown here, as it's a lot. It's a bunch of CSS up in the head of the page. Followed by our load CSS script, 
which I like to inline in the head just so we're not adding a new external request, even though it's really small. We call that function with the path to each of our CSS files that we want to load asynchronously. These are loaded quick enough because this is all happening up in the head of the page anyway, that there's no visual lag. There's, none, there's no opportunity for the user to scroll really fast as the styles. We just deprioritize the the way the browsers do native. And since we've introduced a dependency on JavaScript, show our CSS at all, which sounds really scary, I like to include a NoScript following. Percent of people with JavaScript wholesale disabled, thrown that sparking knife switch in their browser to shut it down, very, very small. Much more likely that JavaScript will break, and NoScript doesn't account for that. But by inlining this in the head of the document above all of our other JavaScript, we can ensure that this has a very, very good chance of working, even if an error should occur later on in the scripts. This is the number one priority for things that should not break by the other map. We never want to take the time to comb through all of our CSS looking for those above the fold styles, because that sounds like a nightmare. So this is another case for automation. Uh, and a number of tools have sprung up to take care of this for us. Looking at all the styles in a rendered page and outputting a block of critical CSS styles. Of course, if you're using Grunt, there's a Grunt task for that. This looks horrifying. This looks like we're now creating a maintenance nightmare for ourselves, or at the best case, something we have to copy and paste every time we build the site. By using this Grunt task as part of a build step, this critical CSS exists on a server every time we make a change to the site. We push this and have something on the back end say, if this file exists, pull it into the head of the page as soon as the page is we're using this on HBR. No one ever has to touch it. It looks weird when you hit view source. Yeah. But there's no maintenance involved. There's really no overhead. Once it's set up, it just says, if that critical file exists, use it. If not, carry on and the page as usual. The other optimization we make with this is that this is a huge, huge benefit on the initial page load. This makes the page show up immediately. Subsequent page loads would be pulling the whole style sheet from the cache. This is still pretty quick, but actually not as fast on subsequent page loads. So we set a cookie that says the cache is primed once you've used critical CSS. On all subsequent visits, just load the style sheet from the cache as usual. It is ridiculous what a difference this makes. It is a huge, huge difference. And as scary as it looks as a build step, minification is a lot scarier. It's something that happens invisibly. Once we have a, I am so mad on the time right now. Once we have a page showing up as quickly as possible, we can start looking for more specific points of failure. Web fonts are one of the biggest ones. Most browsers will wait around three seconds for a font to be pulled in. And in performance terms, that's a lifetime. WebKit-based browsers before showing the fallback text while trying to load a web font. And that's Safari, older Android, Blackberry, they still exist. Wait a full 30 seconds web font to load before giving up and showing the fallback text. That's a broken website. No user's going to wait around for half a minute to see if text shows up there. I don't know what web fonts are, we do. We think 30 seconds is probably pretty reasonable. It's not for the average user. This is a huge single point of failure, no matter how fast the website is otherwise. This does not necessarily fail in the kinds of ways we might expect. The not in this headline was italicized. That meant a request for the italicized version of the font. That request timed out. The regular font request did not. In older versions of WebKit, for a scary 30 seconds, Mitt Romney was officially running for president. This is not something I'm willing to voice upon my users. Fontface itself has a pretty smart syntax. Now, the fallback pattern is built in. So no matter what format a browser might need, it still means only one request for each type of font they might, necessarily, they might need. For a while, I advocated taking the same approach as we used with our uh, icons. Rather than linking out to a handful of standalone font files, we include them all in a single style sheet with data URIs, and then load that asynchronously. It was pretty quick. It was quicker than it was relying on font face in a vacuum. I used with our web squirrels web font generator for this, which just had a checkbox. Done asynchronously use that same load CSS function. Now you might see your fallback text for a split second 
for the web fonts loaded. But honestly, I consider that to be a feature. The user lands on a very fast website and there's the text they were looking for right away, even if another request times out. Nobody wants to sit and wait for your web fonts to load when they were there with purpose, they were there with something to do. The drawback is that you're now inlining all of your font files, and so you lose font pages' ability to only load the assets it needs. In data URI form, this is not what I would call super technical. This is one law file, meaning one font, one weight, one style. And you don't have just one of these on your website. You have tons of these. And it's every single fallback. Which means if you have four different fonts in play, you have 600 of these, and you're stuck really bad at math. You have a lot of these, and you're stuck really bad. The web standards has fortunately caught up with us a little bit here. Um, there's a brand new font event spec. It only exists natively in Chrome, as far as I know. It gives us a JavaScript API to tell us when our fonts have loaded. Instead of hacking around the normal font base pattern and breaking the prefetching, we can actually now just apply our fonts after we're sure they've been loaded. By doing this, we're not blocking any of the text. We're showing our fallback text, waiting for those fonts to load. And then we apply a class the page that says fonts loaded, now pull in those, those different fonts. That's it. You're done. This is all you need and no changes to anything else. This is a brand new spec. Um, Ron Stein put together a great poly for this. We're using this on HBR2. Again, it's not live yet. This took all of 10 minutes. This is very, very easy to do. It makes a huge, potentially a 30 second delay difference for a user. Ran three versions of the HBR homepage through web page test. One with plain old font face, one using the font events pattern, and one using that old asynchronous data URI pattern we used to use. These are on a throttled connection. Data URIs were faster than the old fashioned, just add font face way by a full second. But the font event pattern is one full second faster than that. This is very, very cool. And after all we've done, it's incredibly important that we don't consider our performance work. You blocking requests or an uncompressed ping, and we're in trouble. You can't rely on anybody who might ever touch the site. Inky swearing at working this long. So, just like any other set of unit tests, this grunt task will, okay, will, every time you build the site, check to see if there have been any performance regressions. And if it falls below a certain threshold that you set, you've broken the build. And if that happens, you now can't just up the threshold the same way you would delete a tech, uh, unit test. Now you have to go and look at who added a big ping, who added a carousel or a mission critical flash intro. And if you can't shave that down, you have to make up a difference somewhere else on the site. You have to move another feature. So listen, if you'll indulge me and I said I would, I am going to talk about woodworking one final time. I'm actually going to talk about you. I was not a fancy woodworker prior to just a couple years ago when I started tinkering in my workshop in my apartment. Everything was covered in tiles. I was a contractor. I did grunt work. I did, you know, additions and roofing. If you live in Cambridge, especially North Cambridge, I'm going to build your porch. Pretty good chance. It wasn't glamorous work. There were no intricate carvings. There were no exotic South American hardwoods that never cut a dovetail. It was cheap pine and nail guns and roofing shingles and very bad beer. Loved that work. I loved it deeply. And not because I planned on winning any awards for building a porch. It was simple, functional work. And I walked by it and still, a lot of it still, like now, I live in North Cambridge. There's a set of stairs a block from my apartment that those homeowners will have forever. They outlived to my father, who outlived me. No one will ever think about them when they're carrying groceries into their house. Because we did our jobs the right way. Nobody ever notices when a window isn't drafty. They notice when it is. That work was beautiful to me because it was invisible. Because we built the purpose. We didn't build a porch. We built the place you sit to drink your coffee. We didn't build a roof. We protected your home from this past winter. That's the meaning I take from work. 
ephemeral as it seems, as a medium. When we work harder, we get better at doing things the right way. When we get better at doing things the right way. We build something that will on a website. Something that hopefully will outlast every one of us here. We build a connection between every single person in the world and all the information in the world. We do more than just build websites. We build for purpose. 